The primary ethical responsibility of a, of a clinician is to recommend beneficial treatments, beneficial interventions to their patients. So if vaccines are beneficial, uh, then uh, physicians uh, and other clinicians, prescribers should recommend those vaccines. Welcome to On Medical Grounds. Our guest for this episode of White Coat Radicals is Dr. Mark Naven, here to talk with us about medical ethics and politicized medicine. Dr. Naven is professor and chair of philosophy at Oakland University. His research is primarily in clinical ethics and ethics in public health. Hello, Dr. Naven, and welcome to On Medical Grounds. Thank you for having me, Jane. I'm really excited to be here. In 2019, you co-authored an article titled Reasons for Vaccine Refusal and Vaccination Behaviors. What are the most common reasons for vaccine refusal? So the reasons people have for refusing vaccines, in particular parents have for refusing childhood vaccines, they vary depending on the vaccine. So um, someone might be concerned about autism when it comes to MMR. Uh, they might be concerned about um, other considerations for HPV. And then clearly we see during COVID a whole set of other reasons. But in general, the most uh, common reasons people have for either refusing or being hesitant about vaccines are about safety, or they're worried about adverse events and complications. Uh, and uh, efficacy, right? They believe that either the vaccine doesn't work or that it's unnecessary for them in virtue of their, their health history or their, you know, their strong uh, immune system. Uh, less common reasons uh, include ethical or religious objections that aren't so much about safety uh, or efficacy outcomes, but are about kind of intrinsic violations of, of sanctity or, or of moral requirements. So for example, we've seen in the context of COVID, People raise concerns about using vaccines that were developed uh, or tested using materials that were uh, originally derived from aborted uh, fetuses. Uh, and then uh, there are all kinds of reasons that, uh, that people might give um, to delay uh, or to find an alternative vaccine schedule. Um, and then there are other, these reasons also bear on, on just differences in attitudes and beliefs that make people more or less hesitant or more accepting of vaccines. I see. Could you please define vaccination behaviors? Sure. I, I mean there that we sometimes think of vaccination as a binary choice. Either someone is um, sort of all in as a vaccine acceptor or is a kind of committed vaccine refuser. And most people are actually somewhere on the spectrum between those extremes, um, both for vaccine, the sort of number of vaccines they accept or refuse, uh, but also for um, the kinds of attitudes and beliefs they have. So when it comes to routine childhood vaccines, only one to 2% of Americans refuse all routine childhood vaccines, but upwards of 40% or more have some concerns about safety, have some concerns about their children maybe getting too many vaccines at the same time. Uh, and uh, more generally, there's a background of increasing distrust in medical authority, especially sort of politicized medical authority. And so we might place that on a spectrum um, between the extremes and as, as I mentioned, many Americans, maybe upwards of a quarter, uh, are engaging in either slow down vaccine schedules, so that's when you get all the vaccines, but on a, a different schedule, or an alternative schedule where, where you, you maybe skip some doses or some vaccines, but you're still uh, um, receiving other doses and other vaccines. Do medical professionals, such as doctors and nurses, have reasons similar to the general public for vaccine refusal? So both in general and in the context of COVID, um, clinicians, including physicians and, and nurses, nurse practitioners, uh, have much higher rates of vaccine acceptance and vaccination uh, than the general public. But of course, there is vaccine hesitancy and vaccine refusal among this population as well. Uh, and, and many of the reasons are very similar. We recently did a study at my healthcare institution and uh, over 5,000 uh, uh, employees uh, and found uh, that while many of the reasons were similar, there were some distinct reasons. And in particular, uh, we found that um, younger and female uh, um, clinicians, especially nurses, were particularly concerned about fertility. Uh, and they were not anti-vaccine, they were pro-vaccine, but they, many of them had actually been exposed to COVID and had recovered from COVID, those working in, in more acute care uh, uh, settings and on our COVID units. So they were not so much concerned about the COVID uh, as a disease. Uh, they felt they had good immune protection, but they were worried uh, in the light of the, the fact that the, the vaccine was recently developed uh, about potential uh, safety issues. Uh, and so they were choosing to delay the vaccine for that reason. And so, uh, so you might see, uh, while, while many of the reasons are the same or similar, right, some, some sort of differences 
especially when it comes about uh, physicians and nurses who maybe have more exposure to medical errors uh, and maybe more informed kinds of distrust of uh, medical institutions. Is it ethical for a medical professional to encourage their patients to refuse vaccinations? Well, so the primary ethical responsibility of a, of a clinician is to recommend beneficial treatments, beneficial interventions to their patients. So if vaccines are beneficial, uh, then uh, physicians uh, and other clinicians, prescribers should recommend those vaccines. And if they're not beneficial, they shouldn't. Now, of course, for almost all patients uh, at almost all times, uh, recommended vaccines are going to be beneficial. So physicians ought to recommend them. Uh, but it's, it's a difficult question uh, because while there are recognized medical disorders and allergies that might place uh, patients at heightened risk of vaccine complications, there are also broader sort of social uh, reasons why delaying or even uh, um, abstaining from a vaccine might be useful. So for example, uh, children who uh, are severely mentally disabled, who have to be subject to physical restraints or chemical restraint in order to be vaccinated, uh, there's a reasonable argument to be made that for some vaccines, delaying that vaccine or grouping them differently uh, might actually be best for the child. That is to say, in trying to balance the, the marginal increase to their, their health outcomes associated with vaccination against the, the real assault to their person associated with coercive delivery of the vaccine. In 2020, you co-authored an article titled Reasons to Accept Vaccine Refusers in Primary Care. I know we just discussed a reason. Are there other ethical reasons besides physical reasons, such as perhaps religious reasons? So, so of course, I think physicians should not discriminate against patients who can't be vaccinated, right, for medical reasons. But I think actually that, that even though physicians have a right to choose their patients, uh, a right the American Medical Association, I think, is quite, quite rightfully defended, that the physicians have an obligation to exercise that right in an ethical way. So for example, it would be unethical to discriminate against patients merely based on their race. Um, this isn't the same, but, but, but I think um, physicians ought not either dismiss or refuse to accept families merely because they express skepticism or refusal about vaccines. And that's largely because children need to be in care. Uh, there's no evidence that threatening to dismiss or not accept these families changes parents' minds and makes them more likely to agree to vaccinate. Uh, and in fact, we, we know that what happens is one of three things. Either these children who are, whose families are dismissed or not accepted into a practice, uh, they end up with no care. They end up with substandard care. They're with a naturopath or homo homeopath. Uh, or they end up clustered in one of the few remaining pediatricians uh, who will accept them, which increases geometrically the risks of outbreaks in those practices. Uh, and also, I think, unfairly burdens one's colleagues. Uh, with um, with families and children who who you know are, are sometimes very difficult uh, to care for. Uh, I also think the reasons in favor of dismissal and acceptance are not very strong. There's limited evidence that uh, clinicians are at increased legal liability for maintaining these patients in their practice. Um, increased disease transmission risks can, I think, be well addressed in the way that uh, pediatricians deal with having ill patients in clinic all the time. Uh, and and so I think. Um, we ought to be much less complacent than, frankly, the American Academy of Pediatrics has recently been about this practice, um, which now a uh, recent paper shows almost half of pediatricians are not accepting or refusing uh, or dismissing these families. Hmm. Is it ethical to prescribe an unproven treatment to a patient? Well, there's no proof in science. Proof is something in logic and mathematics. And so in science, we have more or less evidence. Uh, and of course, we should uh, we would want clinicians to prescribe uh, treatments that for which there is very good evidence of their safety and their efficacy. Of course, there are lots of different kinds of evidence. Um, when it comes to, to pharmaceutical products, we, we look for FDA approval. We also look for medical societies statements uh, on, on so what they think best practices are. Uh, and then and then more directly with the research, we want to see high quality review studies and uh, based on sort of high quality, large sample size, uh, randomized controlled trials. Importantly, though, I think um, off-legal prescription is often ethical. It's a mainstay of, of psychiatry, of, uh, of pediatrics, um, and, and lots of other specialties, too. Uh, and, and so we should want physicians, especially a point about medical education, we should want physicians to be trained not just in the core sciences, but in the ability to judge the quality and quantity of evidence uh, so that they can actually be really well-informed and ethically responsible uh, when they are choosing to prescribe off-label off or when they are sort of deviating from 
maybe what has been identified as a best practice or, or received institutional approval. Should the doctor tell the patient that this is uh, an unproven treatment or an, uh, should the patient be made aware that they're trying something that's off label? So I think it's a standard part of informed consent that patients are both capacitated to make a decision, right? They're doing so voluntarily without coercion that they're well informed about the decision. And part of being well informed about a decision is, uh, is, is understanding the kind of evidence that there is. Uh, and so um, patients should be informed about whether a treatment is experimental, uh, about whether it is uh, off-label, but for which there's a really good evidence based. Uh, they should uh, you know, ha have an understanding of, of the comparative risks and benefits associated with both treatment and non-treatment. And I think that's a standard part of the informed consent process. That makes sense. Now, if you were to create a Venn diagram with one circle encompassing medical ethics and the other containing politics, where would they overlap? Well, so I think of politics as the coordination of social activity via formal rules backed by power. Uh, and, if, and if that's what we think politics is, I think almost all of medicine is therefore political because it's about formal coordination of activity backed by power. Uh, and, and, and I think you don't have to look far to see that. So do, does the patient have the power to make decisions about their care? Well, do they have decision-making capacity? And who has the power to make that decision? Uh, is an incapacitated patient surrogate going to be empowered to make decisions? Well, are they acting in the way the surrogate should? Who's making that decision? Uh, we saw that both in the hospital and in the courts. Are we going to allow parents to choose um, uh, to refuse treatments that are beneficial for children? Uh, or are we going to call Child Protective Services or get an ethics consult? How are we going to bring power to bear there? And, and there are all kinds of sort of these contestations of power that are made both explicit and frankly, most of them are hidden in medicine, which I, I think often pretends to be relying on a very patient autonomy, voluntarist model, but in fact, sort of inscribes power in all kinds of hidden ways in ways that I think are, are political, which is to say medical ethics is not just philosophy, but it's about how we navigate uncertainties and conflicts between differing ethical and religious and value systems in a pluralistic democratic society. So I think in some ways, it's, it's much harder than it might first appear to be. However, though, if what you mean by political is having to do with Democrats versus Republicans in our kind of partisan conflicts, then sure, much of medical ethics is, is political that way. Maybe not all of it, but much of it is clearly around life issues, abortion, serialization, contraception, but increasingly also around uh, other kinds of life issues like determination of death by neurological criteria. So for example, my hospital systems had to go to court recently a number of times to sort of affirm the, the, the right of the hospital system to no longer treat corpses, that is say, patients who are dead because of neurological criteria, because the family, based on their religious and, and sort of politicized pro-life ideas, uh, believed that those patients were alive because they maintained circulatory function. And so I think we're likely to see increased politicization of sort of ethically charged conflict in medicine, uh, among other reasons, because we are living in a hyper-politicized time in which the political parties are increasingly polarized. What do you see as the biggest ethical dilemmas in healthcare today? I think the biggest problem is lack of access to high quality health care and, and inequalities in that kind of access based on race and class, among other things. That's not a dilemma because we kind of know what the problem is and we know what we ought to do. The issue is the lack of political will to, to solve that problem. In terms of dilemmas, right? Dilemma is when uh, you've got two options and both of them are bad. I think one of the big dilemmas is, is, is the age old dilemma, which is between doing what we think yields the best outcomes versus doing what we think best empowers patients and citizens to make decisions for themselves. And so this occurs all the time in clinic. This is, you know, patients uh, um, who have mental illness or cognitive disability or the sort of every year, the more and more millions of patients with various stages of Alzheimer's and dementia. How do you empower them at the same time that you're trying to, to help their families decide what's best for them? Um, I think though in, in the context of COVID, we've seen a real crisis in the ethical languages we use in public health. We know that vaccines are good for people. We know that herd immunity, community protection is good for all of us. And so we're trying to use power in various ways to make that happen. At the same time, we, we know that vaccination is also a personal medical choice governed by uh, the norm of, of informed consent. That is to say that the sort of valorization of, of a patient's autonomous decision-making. And so I think there's a, there's a really difficult conflict there between the, um, the late 20th century ideas about bioethics, emphasizing patient rights, uh, and uh, a more traditional understanding of, of public health as focused on overall good outcomes.
for people. And, and I, that's a dilemma because I, there aren't any good answers. And, and, and I think we as a country are struggling to work through uh, that problem as we speak. Should people who post on social media and politicians be held accountable to the same ethical standards as medical professionals? Well, so medical professionals have a special obligation in particular to patients, right, to, um, to do what's good for them. But I think even when medical professionals are speaking to the public, they also are speaking as members of a, of a profession that has a particular ethical mission to promote health. So not just for their patients, but their communities. And in fact, professional societies, especially American Academy of Pediatrics are very explicit on this, that when pediat pediatricians speak in public, they, they're governed by a, a kind of ethical identity to promote what is good for the health of the community. Uh, of, of course, we shouldn't want people in social media lying to us or politicians deceiving or harming us. Uh, but, but they are not governed by similar kinds of professional norms. Um, also, the, the language of held accountable is, is interesting. Physicians are, as a profession, autonomous, right? They hold each other accountable in light of their shared ethical ideas. Uh, whereas social media, if it's held accountable at all, is held accountable by the market, or sometimes by you know, restrictions on freedom of speech, which is an explicitly sort of external kind of power. And then politicians in as much as they're the guardians, they, 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 are, they are guarded themselves only by the power of the people uh, uh, to, to sort of kick them out of office. Because um, I'm not very confident that they are governed by robust ethical norms of their own. I think you already answered this question, but let me, let me reiterate. So if a healthcare provider, a medical professional is communicating via social media, they're held to the same ethical standards as if they were still at work. Is that correct? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. So at work, at work, when you're talking with a patient, you have a special obligation, right, to, uh, uh, to care for them, especially if they're already your patient, right? So you can't abandon patients, for example. Even if you want to terminate care, there's a, a positive duty to try and arrange uh, a kind of transfer, a continuation of care. Physicians don't owe, owe that kind of duty to random strangers, right? So if, if a physician posts something on the internet and, and someone says, you know, asks for for sort of treatment advice, the physician doesn't have an obligation to enter into a, uh, a clinical relationship, a uh, therapeutic relationship with that person. I do think though that, that physicians who present themselves in public as physicians do have to um, be governed by the ethical norms more generally of their profession, uh, which is about promoting uh, people's good health outcomes, but also trying to empower people to make good choices for themselves. Now it's, it's a really vexed question because um, uh, in clinic, I think it's pretty straightforward what physicians need to do to try and help patients have good outcomes. Once you're in, in contested political spaces, it's not so clear. So just to put the point this way, physicians are one of the most trusted and, uh, uh, professions in the country when it comes to healthcare. In fact, nurses are the most trusted. Um, so you might think that means they should be the most vocal voices in uh, our political conflicts about public health. But there's reason to think that, that what what it happens when physicians and nurses enter the fray that way is, is they actually become part of, of partisan politics and they undermine their own status, that, that, that they become part of the, the contested political sphere rather than sort of elevating somehow above it. So I think there's some really difficult questions about how clinicians should use their authority when they're engaging in activism or lobbying or sort of just speaking in public, because they need to do that, I think, uh, but, but also to do so in ways that are actually going to be effective and not actually backfire or be counterproductive. What were you hoping that I would ask you today? I think we've talked about an awful lot. Uh, thank you so much for the chance to, to have some conversation. Thank you so much for taking time from your busy schedule to speak with us today. Thanks for this conversation. And thank you for listening to the On Medical Grounds podcast. We know your time is valuable. The resources that were referred to in this podcast can be found at onmedicalgrounds.com. Be sure to click the subscribe button to be alerted when we post new content. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review it and share it with your friends or colleagues. This podcast is protected by copyright and may be freely used without modification for educational purposes. To find more information or to inquire about commercial use, please visit our website on medicalgrounds.com.